My name is Frank Sisson. I'm from the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, and I find this uh, presentation particularly exciting. Uh, on the one hand, because a mere 53 years ago, I began writing a seminar paper at Harvard on the Makhno movement, uh, gathering sources uh, meager as they were at that time. And that gives me a connection with it. But even more so, uh, because of our speaker today and our accomplishments. Sean Patterson is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Alberta, where he researches Civil War era Ukrainian Makhnovist movement. He is the recipient of the 2002-2003 Neporani Doctoral Fellowship offered by the Canadian Foundation for Ukrainian Studies. He's the author of Makhno and Memory, Anarchist and Mennonite Narratives, of Ukraine's Civil War, 1917 to 1921. I might add that was his master's thesis carried out in a joint program of the universities of Manitoba and Winnipeg. Uh, it was uh, then turned into an excellent book uh, published by the University of Manitoba Press. So he is already an accomplished scholar uh, with an unusual amount of publications for someone who is now writing a PhD. I also want to remind you of that title. He took on the topic of anarchist and Mennonite narratives and put them together. Uh, this uh, is uh, a tall order uh, and one in which one has to think about one's readers and recipients and uh, how they will receive it. Uh, and I hope he will tell us something about that today as well. But today, what he turns to is a remarkably uh, important and exciting topic uh, of turning to a source that was long known to exist, already from the 1920s, uh, and uh, uh, studied by or been able to look at by very few, which he has now been able to examine thoroughly. Uh, we also will find out the degree, and this has been much speculated, uh, as the degree to which Helena Kuzmenko influenced the Maknevist movement. Uh, so we will hear today his talk on An Inconvenient Diary, Retrieving Helena Kuzmenko's Voice from Makhnovist historiography. Sean. Thank you very much, Frank. And thank you to the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies and the Monk School for sponsoring this talk. Um, so over the course of the Ukrainian Civil War, supporters of the peasant insurgency known as the Makhnovshina, uh, they composed many poems and songs. And uh, while the movement's leader, Nesta Makhno, was the most reoccurring figure in these, in these compositions, uh, sometimes others were valorized, as in the following Chastivka up there, and it reads as Ura, 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 uh, let's go to the enemy for Mother Helena, for Batko, or for Father, uh, for Machno. And Mother Helena here refers to uh, Machno's wife, Helena Kuzmenko. And despite her celebration, as in this, in this poem, uh, on almost equal footing with Machno, uh, she remains enigmatic and quite under-researched. And um, overall in the literature, very much covered by a thick cloud of rumor and myth, and as we'll find out, even fabrications. Uh, so my goal here today is to um, work towards untying Kuzmenko's knotted life narrative. And if not to separate fact from fiction, then to at least examine some of these threads of her history against each other that have come down to us through historical writing and through popular lore. And in the process, I'll center Kuzmenko's voice uh, through her life writings uh, in an effort to accord her a certain amount of historical agency that she generally hasn't had, I think, over, over the decades. Uh, I contrast Kuzmenko's voice against various writers that have attempted to instrumentalize her story for their own purposes, usually propagandistic purposes. And at the same time, 
I'll show how her writings have proven quite inconvenient and resistant to being co-opted by both pro-Soviet and uh, pro-Machnavist literature. So today we'll be looking at uh, three topics or three themes that have caused controversy um, in her life. And those are Makhno and Kuz Kuzmenko's romance, uh, Kuzmenko's civil war diary, and her political beliefs. So I hope what emerges from this exploration of her life and writings is the self-image of a highly intelligent and independent woman with a layered identity. Um, someone who was committed uh, but also critical of the Machnavist movement, ethnically an ethnically conscious Ukrainian, but also one that was repeatedly brought to the end of herself by the desperation of war, exile, and imprisonment. Uh, so just to give an idea of the, the source base that, that I've been using in my research, um, of course, there's archival documents, however, uh, very few related directly to her have survived, uh, aside from her diary. Um, I also use interviews and letters, uh, that, that private letters that she wrote, um, published articles. She actually wrote a number of memoirs in the 1930s that were published in uh, anarchist, uh, anarchist newspapers. And finally, uh, Quite importantly, which is more recently uh, found, was intelligence files, both French uh, and Soviet uh, intelligence files, that talk about her activities um, in the interwar period. Um, and then there's also a file, uh, a post-World War II file, um, that uh, details her interrogation by the NKVD, um, which eventually led to her, her imprisonment in, uh, in the Soviet Union. So, um, before I move to her, to uh, Kuzmenko's life herself, I just want to touch on some of the historiographical highlights of, I guess, what we could prematurely call Kuzmenko studies. Um, so, the first person to seriously discuss Kuzmenko was uh, Sergei Simanov. Uh, he was a Russian historian. Um, in 1966, he wrote an article on the Machnevshina, um, which was actually, it was a, quite a taboo topic to be writing about at that time. And uh, in response to that article, Kuzmenko wrote a letter to Simanov to correct his various errors. And this led to an extensive correspondence between the pair and a research trip by uh, Simanov in October 1968 to interview Kuzmenko in Kazakhstan, uh, where, where she lived at that time. Uh, Kuzmenko also sent Simanov various private letters of correspondence with her family. Um, and this material that Simanov collected wasn't published until 1993. Um, but many of the sources that he collected do survive down to today in his personal archive at the Russian State Library. Um, However, the work that Simonov produced, uh, it, it has a number of weaknesses. For instance, uh, the, his presentation of Kuzmenko's story is quite fragmented and interspersed with a variety of sort of questionable observations, uh, such as his graphological analysis of Kuzmenko's handwriting, which he believed uh, the, the capitalized letters and rounded letters indicated an ambition amounting to despotism as well as secrecy. Um, so, but more seriously than that was that some I found when I was going through the material that Simonov actually sometimes changes Kuzmenko's words from what she originally wrote into what he published, and sometimes with uh, sometimes significantly changes the meaning of what she wrote. Uh, but nonetheless, Simonov is is important for collecting this material. Um, a second person is uh, Viktor Yelansky. Uh, who pre also preserved a large number of letters, and, and he also interviewed Kuzmenko in the 70s. Yelansky uh, was a native of Hulepole, Makhno's uh, hometown, and the great and great nephew of Mr. Makhno. Uh, he corresponded with Kuzmenko in the 70s and maintained an extensive family archive, and also brought Kuzmenko to Hulepole uh, in 1976. Uh, where he recorded these, these interviews with her. 
In 1999, uh, Yelansky co-authored a book with Larissa Ferbovka entitled Nestor and Helena, uh, which included 26 letters and a longer autobiography uh, written by Kuzmenko. Uh, Yelansky's original materials were kept in his house, um, which was actually slated to become a museum um, until Russia's, uh, Russia's invasion recently intervened with this process. And actually, the house that was to become the museum has been, slight, has been partially damaged as a result of shelling. Um, so the material, some of the materials were transferred to the local history museum, um, but their exact location and, uh, and whether any of them have suffered damage is, is not entirely known at the moment. And a final person I just want to mention quickly is Alexander Skripnik, uh, who is a Ukrainian specialist in the history of intelligence services. And uh, he recently wrote two articles about Makhno um, uh, based on Makhno's uh, Soviet foreign intelligence file. And uh, so this is talking about the interwar period when uh, Makhno and Kuzmenko were living in, in Paris. And one of his articles, Skripnik's articles, uh, focuses on the Soviet intelligence efforts to cultivate uh, and recruit Kuzmenko for, uh, for their own purposes during the interwar period. And I also consulted this file in, in, in my research, but Skripnik appears to have had full access to the file. I, didn't, I wasn't able to gain full access to it. So his works are definitely worth reading in, in this, this regard as it provides a lot of insight into that period. So Ahafia, or later Helena Andreevna Kuzmenko, was born on January 9th, 1897 in Kiev. According to uh, Kuzmenko, she was born to a family of former serfs. Uh, her father worked as a low-level clerk in the Tsarist security police at a railway station. And in 1908, he abruptly quit his job and uh, brought his family to his village of origin, Peshani Brit, uh, that was then in uh, Kherson province, uh, where the, the family there took up uh, farming. And uh, Kuz Kuzmenko, as a child, excelled in school, and upon graduation, she received a four-year government scholarship that allowed her to study at a teacher's college for women. Um, while she was studying there, she tutored classmates and uh, children between studies, which provided her with financial independence from her family. Um, she specialized in the Ukrainian language and literature and graduated in 1916. Um, according to her surviving grade transcript, she did exceptionally well in college, although her grade in singing was uh, not very good, so she probably couldn't carry a tune very well. But um, she, after she graduated, she ended up teaching in Hulai Pula, uh, before then attending St. Volodymyr's University for one academic year. Uh, and there she continued her studies in Ukrainian language, history, literature. Uh, after, and oh, also she, she also worked briefly in a secretarial job at the Ministry of Labor in Kyiv. Uh, she then requested to be reappointed to Hule Pule uh, to teach the Ukrainian language there. Um, so it's at that point that uh, she returns and her life radically changes. She becomes more involved with the, uh, the Makhnevist movement as it develops in Hule Pule. So the first meeting um, between these, between Makhno and Kuzmenko is, it's wrapped up in a lot of lore. There's many versions of this story, and I'm going to just provide a, a few versions um, and compare them against each other. So, one such variant comes uh, from Volin, who was a famous anarchist at the time, and he was also an important ideologue of the movement. He ser served as chairman of the Military Revolutionary Soviet for the Makhnevist movement in 1919. And he claims that this, that this version came directly from uh, Kuzmenko herself. Uh, Volin calls the encounter um, and their romance as engagement by revolver. Uh, he describes Makhno as kicking in Kuzmenko's classroom door with a, quote, nasty, crooked smile and accusing her of filling children's minds with bourgeois ideas. Makhno throws a book to the ground and demands Kuzmenko pick it up. She refuses, and Makhno threatens to shoot her. 
uh, Kuzmenko res Resolute says she is not afraid of Machno. And Machno, impressed with her bravery, falls in love with her on the spot. <laughs> so other similar versions have this kind of sim sinister feel to it, with um, one in which Kuzmenko is hiding in a closet, terrified of Machno, and another, another one in which Machno uh, threatens to drown Kuzmenko's parents if they don't allow, allow him to marry her. But uh, Kuzmenko herself actually did record two, uh, two accounts of meeting Machno, but they also differ from each other. Um, but the, the emphasis that in, in, her, uh, in her versions is more on her own empowerment than it is on this kind of engagement by revolver or stolen bride narrative. So in the first version that uh, Kuzmenko gave, uh, she says that she first met Machno in the fall of 1917 when she was volunteering to help distribute propaganda for the local anarchists. And she recalls that one day Machno walked into a tightly packed room which caused her to knock over a stack of leaflets. And like in Volin's rendition, Machno demands that she picks up the papers to which Kuzmenko refuses. And Machno once again threatens her with a gun. In turn, Kuzmenko, uh, she says to Machno, quote, a decent cultured person would not do such a thing. You were obviously not brought up to use weapons against unarmed women. And so I am not afraid of you. Uh, Kuzmenko then describes it sometime later. She uh, baked a cake for Machno for his birthday. And at the birthday, she danced with Machno to the famous uh, Yabluchka song. Machno uh, was so taken by her dancing that he asked his guests to leave, and the pair departed on a romantic Tachanka ride. Um, and yet another version that was told by Kuzmenko, which is dated to spring 1919, instead of kicking in her classroom door, Machno enters quietly into the room and sits amongst the students. Uh, he asks to see Helena in private, whereupon he drops his pistol and asks her to pick it up, and she refuses. In a fluster, Machno declares her his wife and leaves. Later that evening, Machno uh, returns to her and admits that he was intimidated by her confidence and beauty, and that he had actually come to uh, to ask her to be a secretary in the army. Uh, Kuzmenko is taken by his boyish awkwardness and uh, asks him, well, what's it going to be, secretary or wife? And <laughs> so Machno places his pistol in, in her hands and says, quote, the wife of Nestor Machno cannot be without a weapon. Um, she also emphasizes in this version that Machno is quite respectful to her, that he didn't try to hug or kiss her on the first night. And it was after that that they began their romance. So they have all these various versions. They're, they're quite hard to reconcile. But it's obviously it's quite clear here that Kuzmenko was attempting to counter these kind of nefarious engagement by revolver narratives. And uh, she, so she herself was recounting her meeting with Machno in a way that emphasized her own power, her ability to tame Machno, and uh, very much the consensual nature of this relationship. And uh, this is just a picture of Volin and uh, a colorized picture of uh, Kuzmenko in Paris in, in the 1930s. So her Civil War activities, uh, as I mentioned, very few archival documents uh, that mention her have survived. Um, but what we do know from this period is that she was a, uh, she served as the head of the school section of the Machnavist Cultural Educational Department. And this organized education in, uh, in the territories that they controlled. It raised funds, and it developed curriculum. And uh, so from what we, under, what we know about the this, this school section, the pedagogical approach that they, uh, that they adopted uh, very much emphasized the freedom of the child. It was actually based off of um, a Spanish uh, anarchist's uh, uh, educational model called the modern school, Francisco Ferrer's modern school. And uh, this emphasized uh, direct experience, self-empowerment, and experimentation in education for children. And uh, the, the image below there is just a general meeting call for a Ukrainian school in Katerinoslav, uh, which uh, it's assumed you know, would have involved uh, uh, Kuzmenko's organization. 
Um, so the only description of Kuzmin, what could be called Kuzminko's teaching here comes from um, a commander of the Ukrainian People's Army, uh, Foti Melishko, uh, who uh, was actually acquainted with Kuzmenko uh, during her university years. And Melishko uh, describes Kuzmenko gathering a circle of young female teachers and students uh, to advocate for the, this, an idea called trial marriages. And this involved a two-month probationary period uh, for new couples to live together before they committed to longer-term uh, marriage or, or longer-term relationships. Um, she pointed to herself and her relationship with Machno as evidence for this model working. She quote, she said, allegedly said, uh, I lived a trial marriage with my nester. We got to know each other, then got married, and now are completely happy. So again, we see here this emphasis on the consensual nature of her relationship with Machno. Um, and also her own assertion of feminine power within uh, what, is, what was traditionally a, a patriarchal society. And we also see this broader concern for, for peasant women in general and, uh, and their ability to assert their choices and desires. Um, it's also known that uh, Kuzmenko was a member of the, of the uh, anti uh commission and, or sorry, Commission for anti machnavist Affairs. And this body was created uh, to offset some of the more unaccountable and violent behavior of the Machnavist counterintelligence at the time. The Commission sought to create a kind of streamlined system for investigation and, uh, and punishment. And within the Army, the Commission executed insurgents convicted of looting and other offenses. Um, it's possibly in this capacity that Kuzmenko uh, gained a reputation for executing rapists, which comes up in some of the literature repeatedly. Um, so Kuzmenko's exact political beliefs have also been a long source of debate. And uh, Melishko uh, described her as bookish, an enthusiastic debater, and of a dreamy, romantic disposition. In memoir literature, she's frequently described as highly intelligent, independent, a defender of women, and especially a promoter of Ukrainian language and culture. Uh, some sources also claim that Kuzmenko sympathized with political nationalism uh, and, uh, and also with Simon Petlura's Ukrainian People's Army. Makhno, by contrast, uh, was adamant that Kuzmenko was completely apolitical. Um, one rumor states that in summer of 1919, Kuzmenko traveled behind enemy li lines to Kyiv uh, to make contact with commanders of the Ukrainian People's Army as part of an internal conspiracy against Makhno to merge the Makhnevist army with Petlura. And it is known that Kuzmenko did travel to Kyiv in August 1919. However, her reasons for doing so uh, point in a very different direction. Um, the famous Russian-American anarchist Emma Goldman describes being approached in Kyiv by a young peasant girl introduced as Nestor Makhno's wife. Kuzmenko explained to Goldman uh, that she came with a message from Makhno uh, that he only trusted, to her, trusted her to deliver. And so Kuzmenko enthusiastically explains uh, the Makhnovist cause and uh, requests that Goldman make Makhno's purpose known to the world. Kuzmenko also proposes organizing a faux kidnapping uh, of Goldman and, uh, her, and Goldman's uh, common partner, uh, Alexander uh, Berkman, to take them to Makhno, um, which uh, Goldman declined due to the risk involved in this. Goldman also emphasizes Kuzmenko's interest in, interest in women's liter liberation. The pair uh, discussed it thoroughly and Goldman says, that, says in her memoir that she was shocked that a peasant girl so far from the center of women's rights movement uh, was so passionate about the cause. Uh, Kuzmenko expressed dim dismay that, quote, uh, quote, at the primitive attitude of her people towards women. And Goldman suggested some literature that she could read on the topic. So echoing this interest in women's rights and perhaps even Goldman's list that she gave to Kuzmenko, is a page tucked in the back of uh, Kuzmenko's diary 
and the page is labeled the women's question and it's followed by a, a list of uh, literature on the topic. And it's now to the diary that I'll turn to. So the diary itself, as I mentioned, is quite controversial. Its origins are very obfuscated. Um, the official Soviet account, uh, as related by Robert Eidemann, who is the uh, Red Army's uh, Southern Front Rear Guard commander in, during the Civil War, he claims that the diary was found in a knapsack on March 28, 1920, after an assault on Hule Pule, and uh, claimed that the owner of the diary was killed in the assault. Uh, the diary's entries, written in Ukrainian, range from February 19th to March 28th, 1920. And oddly, the cover of it bore the name Fyodora Gayenko. Uh, excerpts from the diary were published by Eidemann in 1921, while the Civil War and while the fight against Makhno was still in process. Uh, the entries were highly negative, depicting, depicting Makhno as a violent drunkard. Uh, one notorious entry can be, uh, can be interpreted as Makhno having forced himself sexually on the diary's owner. Uh, the diary provided this kind of caricatured image of Makhno as a psychopathic accordion-playing alcoholic that lasted through in Soviet propaganda for many decades. Um, the diary was immediately denounced by Makhno and Arshinov as, quote, a brazen Bolshevik forgery. And Makhno, in, in exile, even challenged the Soviets to publish images of the original. The diary's authenticity was further undermined by the fact that um, certain, uh, certain entries that were published by the Soviets, they didn't match each other from one version to the, to the next. So, for example, Eidemann originally published the March 6th entry in 1921 as, quote, Nestor got drunk and forcefully or strongly uh, harassed or even molested me. Um, however, two years later, 1923, he published the same passage as Nestor got drunk and behaved very insolently or cheekily with me. So it's understandable then that researchers have questioned the, the diary's authenticity just, just because of this, the, the confusion and these different versions that started emerging. Kuzmenko resolved the mystery in part when she disclosed to Simanov that she did indeed keep a diary in a notebook with her best friend's name, Fyodora Gayenko, on the cover. Uh, however, her, uh, her version of its capture significantly differs uh, from Eidemann's account. So according to Kuzmenko, she explained that uh, she and Gayenko were driving wagons when they were stopped by Red Army soldiers who demanded they trade soldiers. And the diary was in one of these requisitioned wagons and was lost in that way. So it's possible here that Eidemann was revising events in service of Bolshevik propaganda, um, perhaps to indicate a, a great victory in having you know, eliminated Makhno's wife in, in battle or something, something to that effect. Um, for decades, the diary remained largely uh, forgotten, and, uh, and, and it wasn't available. Nobody was able to look at it for many, many decades in, in, in the archives. Um, in 1988, however, uh, Volodymyr, Volodymyr Kobzar published a, version, a Ukrainian version of it. And Kobzar incorrectly claimed that the diary was written in Russian and with only a few Ukrainian words, and that he translated it from this, uh, from this alleged Russian into full Ukrainian. Um, and then, two years later, Kobzar published another version, uh, another Ukrainian version, at this time claiming that it was a direct reproduction of the original diary. Uh, however, in comparing these versions against the original, both of them deviate from the original, and there's, there's missing, uh, missing sections, and there's also words that are changed in that. So this, to me, suggests that he was actually working from typescripts in the archives, there's, uh, there, there's a number of typescripts that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. Um, the most accurate version of the diary to be translated was a Russian version of it that was published by Ilya Altman in 1990, who at the time was an archivist in Moscow, um, where he rediscovered the original diary in the Central Archive of the October Revolution. 
And Altman at that time actually discussed the diary on national television. Um, and he even debated anarchists at the Moscow State University uh, over its authenticity. Uh, he also responded to Makhno's challenge for, for publishing images. And uh, this is, so these are Im actual images of the diary that he published in 1990. Um, <clears throat> so concerning the diary's authenticity itself, um, I, don't, I personally don't see any grounds to consider it forged or tampered with in any way. Um, there are many examples of Kuzmenko's handwriting that, uh, that, that have survived, and you can compare the, the diary's handwriting to these, uh, to, to these samples. And Kuzmenko's handwriting across the decades is marked by um, a distinct clarity and neatness, and a kind of a, like a school, a school teacher's neatness to her writing. Um, and the diary's handwriting uh, you know, closely matches matches the other handwriting. Um, the diary is marked throughout with red underlines and asterisks and exclamation points, and presumably these were made by Soviet translators. Uh, but the writing itself doesn't show any telltale signs of intervention like added passages or, or uh, inserted lines uh, of text. So in my opinion, the discrepancies uh, between the diaries published versions are better explained by the various typescripts and translations that were made by the Soviets and kept in the archives. Uh, at least six uh, such typescripts exist that I was able to consult, uh, some in Russian and some in Ukrainian. And by cross-referencing Eidemann's uh, published 1921 and 1923 versions of the diary, it, it was, I was able to determine that he was using two different Russian typescripts um, that were made by Soviet translators. Uh, and it should be noted that the original diary in the Ukrainian does not, does not have wording that could imply a sexual assault, but rather uh, it reads, Nestor got drunk and behaved cheekily or insolently towards me. So that was very, very clearly a, uh, a Soviet insertion in, in the published version of the diary. Um, so. In, in my opinion, these typescripts don't entirely manufacture entries, but rather they, um, they exaggerate what was already there. And, um, writer, and then writers like Eidemann would take the most salacious passages and, and, and publish them. So um, the end result, though, of this diary's muddled history has been to kind of weaponize Kuzmenko's voice from the side of the Bolsheviks, and by contrast, silence her uh, from the pro-Machnavist perspective. And this has resulted in a situation where the diary hasn't been given its, its due respect, in my opinion, uh, for being a unique document that provides rare insight into a female Ukrainian resistance fighter in the Civil War, and, and also an important Machnavist figure. So the diary itself offers multiple insights. Uh, at the personal level, Kuzmenko clearly sympathizes with the movement, uh, early in the diary, she writes, quote, even a small group of people, weak in strength, but strong in spirit, inspired by a great idea, can achieve things. And unfortunately, she doesn't elaborate on what this idea exactly meant to her, but it's, it's clear throughout the diary that she considers herself an invested participant in this movement. And violence also pervades many of the, the diary's entries. Much of the diary uh, describes uh, Machno and herself in a, a sort of constant cat and mouse game being chased by the Red Army. Um, there are many executions of Red, Ar Red Army soldiers and Czechists that are uh, described in a, in a kind of cold, matter of fact way in short entries. Um, but it is all, she also emphasizes that common Red, Sol Red Army soldiers were um, often disarmed and released after capture. The, uh, the diary takes a darker turn after the February 25th entry in which Machno discovers that one of his brothers had been murdered by the Reds. Um, Kuzmenko records Machno then in, indulging excessively in alcohol um, in, in, the, in subsequent entries, uh, during which she also gives witness to examples of uh, unrestrained violence amongst the, the Machnovists. So for instance, on March 13th, she records Batko was also drinking today. 
uh, talking a lot as he wandered around in a drunken state along the street with an accordion dance and dancing, an especially attractive picture. After each word shamefully swearing, having chatted and danced, he fell asleep. Kuzmenko also describes a drunken Mahnon leading a unit into Khulepole, uh, where they publicly beat former partisans for allegedly not taking up a rifle. Kuzmenko writes that the Khulepolians began to complain quietly, but were afraid to express their dissatisfaction with the Mahnovists openly. Everyone was afraid, and indeed, how how can frightened, intimidated, defenseless villagers protest against any force, let alone the force of drunken Mahnavists who are now in charge and can do whatever they want? Um, the diary's violence reaches a crescendo in um, the March 16th entry where she describes a massacre at a German Lutheran colony. The Mahnavists believed that a white guard unit uh, had killed one of uh, the Mahnavist scouts and, uh, and was stationed in this, uh, in this German colony. Uh, however, they only discovered a German self-defense unit when they attacked the village. Kuzmenko writes that, quote, Marienthal paid dearly for this ill-advised murder. Almost all the inhabitants, with the exception of the very old and very young, were killed. It seems that even the women were killed. And throughout the incident, Kuzmenko, she doesn't, she doesn't absolve herself from what went on. In fact, she, she writes that she was with, she says, I was with the boys on the right flank. We quickly entered the village and began firing on the huts. Those who ran away were overtaken and killed on the spot. Somebody set, set fire to the straw. Grenades were tossed into several huts. It was all over in a hurry. And then in the aftermath of the massacre, the, uh, the colony was stripped of goods and horses. Uh, two Germans who were hiding in a bush uh, were executed, and, an, and another one was found uh, hiding in a Greek village nearby. Um, following the massacre's description, Kuzmenko writes with numb detachment, uh, quote, outdoors it was sunny, warm, and dry. After dinner, we all walked down to the river. A corpse was lying on the bank. Um, the vi this violence of the diary is occasionally interrupted by more positive descriptions of weather and nature and her love for her best friend, Gayenko. A couple of the entries also offer a window on Kuzmenko's emotional life, uh, the longest of which, uh, written a day after the, uh, the Marienthal massacre, describes an effort to save a horse that had fallen into a muddy river. Uh, this entry's emotionality really stands in stark contrast to uh, the previous entry about the massacre. Uh, she describes how the horse was groaning mournfully with a human-like voice, rolling its bloodshot eyes as if appealing for help. And then in the diary's final entry, Kuzmenko expresses her own plea for help uh, in a deeply vulnerable entry. She considers running away with her friend Gayenko and, uh, and then writes how Quote, Nestor said in a fit of temper, if you leave, then don't consider me your husband anymore. Uh, Kuzmenko writes, I must remain here. As a matter of fact, Nestor promised me to create better circumstances, but this hasn't happened yet. What to do? I'm sunk in apathy, indifferent to the whole world, physical and spiritual weakness. What banality, what nastiness. I don't have the heart to follow through to the, uh, follow, th follow this thought through to the end. But despite her great suffering and her doubts, uh, Kuzmenko did remain with Mahno and followed him into exile a year later. Um, and just a note about that last passage there, it's interesting again here with the sort of changes in different versions of, of, the, uh, of the diary, is that one of, the, one of these typescripts actually changes apathy to anarchy in the diary. So then that has led, that, those who were working from that typescript were led to believe that she had become disillusioned with anarchism and that. But the original very, very clearly uh, shows that it it's apathy. Um, so with the struggle, of, uh, the struggle against the Bolsheviks no longer sustainable, Kuzmenko accompanied Makhno across the Romanian border in August 1921. And the following year, she gave birth to their daughter, Yelena, in a Polish internment camp. Kuzmenko and Makhno were indicted for allegedly planning to incite a revolt in eastern Galicia. And after a highly publicized trial, 
Both were acquitted, and eventually the family settled in Paris. In 1927, Machno and Kuzmenko separated for reasons allegedly related to Kuzmenko's pro-Soviet shift in politics. Uh, she unsuccessfully applied to return to Ukraine and began working as a deputy secretary for the pro-Soviet Union of Ukrainian Citizens in France. And according to a Soviet foreign intelligence file, after Makhno's death in 1934, Kuzmenko was recruited by Soviet intelligence agents and tasked to infiltrate the Organization of, Nation organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Um, the report reads that, quote, from now on she will be known as Samuraika. And that was a play on the Soviet's code name for Makhno, which was Samurai. Uh, in, the report, in a report filed by Kuzmenko, she recounts a very revealing conversation with the Ukrainian nationalist uh, Mykola, Mykola uh, Kasp Kaspustian sorry, Kapustiansky. Kapustiansky uh, asks, tell me, do you believe in the Mahnevshina? To which Kuzmenko responded, yes, I was selflessly devo devoted to the movement. It is a shame that, uh, that everything ended so sadly. Uh, when she was pushed on how she felt now, uh, she replied that, quote, the fact that this movement was destroyed speaks to the ideas on popularity amongst the masses. One can cite a whole series of mistakes uh, that we made and so on. Uh, and then she explains how at the moment she was consumed by the conditions of emigrant life to secure bread uh, for herself and her daughter. Pressed further on her beliefs, uh, she replied, quote, before everything, I am a Ukrainian. The interests of Ukraine are dearest of all to me. I gave a lot of health and strength in the struggle against the Bolsheviks, and my hate towards them from the past that had faded has reappeared. The death of my mother and many relatives from starvation cannot help but evoke in me disgust toward the Bolsheviks. I repeat, I am Ukrainian, I love my people, but I do not and will not renounce my anarchist views. So it's difficult here to, to interpret Kuzmenko's Kind of about face um, and her work that was done for Soviet intelligence. It's, um, it can be read in various, various directions, um, and it's hard to untangle her authentic views from, from her manipulations. But her use of her mother's death and, and relative's death in the Holodomor uh, is particularly disturbing. Um, I mean, how, how could Kuzmenko have not felt hatred for the Bolsheviks. Her father was also murdered by the Bolshe Bolsheviks during the Civil War as well. Um, but yet she chose to weaponize her family's victimization in service of the Soviet cause. So perhaps, as, as often is the case with collaboration, uh, she was internally riven by emotional contradictions and competing beliefs and an overwhelming instinct for self-preservation for herself and her daughter uh, in the face of quite desperate circumstances. Um, in the French, in French uh, intelligence files, it, it, uh, it was shown that she also actually applied to move to America, to New York. So it seems that she was quite actively trying to leave France at that time. Uh, Kuzmenko remained in Paris until 1943 when the Nazis recruited her and her daughter for factory labor in uh, Berlin. In 1945, uh, the pair was arrested by the NKVD um, and uh, prosecuted by the Soviets. Interestingly, uh, under interrogation though, Kuzmenko doesn't mention uh, her work for Soviet intelligence. She does mention her work for the Union of Ukrainian Citizens. Um, so that's, it's possible that when she was interacting with agents, she didn't actually know that they directly that they were specifically uh, intelligence agents, and she may have thought she had been working through some of these more representatives of more of these legal uh, legal organizations, pro-Soviet organizations in in Paris. Um, Helena was uh, sentenced to eight years in a Mordovian labor camp, and Yelena was exiled to Kazakhstan. After Kuzmenko's release in 1954. Uh, she reunited with her daughter in Kazakhstan, where they resided for the rest of their lives. Um, in an autobiography written later in life, uh, Kuzmenko asked herself, quote, What was it like being Makhno's wife? 
Inwardly, it was like being seized by the wind and spun around, uh, gasping for air. Outwardly, I went to classes at the school when we were stationed in Hule Pole. Uh, work didn't stop. After classes, I would drop by the headquarters. Everybody there was friendly. The guys were eager to tell me whether Nestor was there or not. Late in the evening or during the night, Nestor and I would inspect the, our outposts on the outskirts of the village. He said that discipline in the army was first and foremost, and that the guys never relaxed their guard. For me, these nights had an air of mystery and romance. Kuzmenko's life was one of extremes caught between love and violence, excitement and desperation. She poignantly articulated the exhausting nature of such oscillations when she wrote in 1934, quote, as if one could describe in a few words the uniformly long, hard, thorny, and heroic path with which the Machnevshina, headed by Machno, walked unselfishly for freedom and justice. No, with a few words, it is impossible to recount and explain everything. It takes much time and space, and it is so weary wearisome to do so. Nevertheless, across the decades, through war, exile, and imprisonment, Kuzmenko left a scattered but wide-ranging autobiography through letters, articles, memoirs, secret files, and a lost diary. And Kuzmenko's life was, was one decidedly chosen by herself, and I think it's only fitting that it be told in her own voice. Thank you. Thank you.